Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode 69 of ADHD for Smartass Women. In this episode, I am going to introduce you to Sally Muzon. Sally is a member of the acclaimed San Francisco Opera Chorus. She has appeared in numerous roles with the company, including second priestess in, oh, Sally, how do you say it? Iphigenie en Tauride. <laughs> Second bridesmaid in The Marriage of Figaro, second girl in Showboat, and second orphan in Der Rosen Cavalier, which is the only one I can say because German was my first language. She has also created roles in three world premieres, La Popolana. Did I get that right? Yep. In two women, Joan in Heart of a Soldier, and is it Sister Liliana? Sister Liliana. Ah, Sister Lillianne. Okay, that sounds very American. In Dead Man Walking. In real life, Sally is an avid reader, union activist, baseball fan, go Giants, and single mother of a collegiate Shakespeare nerd. She is a dedicated alumna of the University of Virginia and now lives in the Bay Area. Sally, welcome. Thank you, Tracy. Hi. Hi, I am so excited to have you here. I just love what you do. I had mentioned to you, you know, I have a mother who was very into music. And so as a child, we would go to rehearsals for the symphony. And my mother really loved the opera and I danced ballet. So we were really into the ballet. And so just hearing about what it is that you do, it just brought me goosebumps. And I loved the fact that you're an ADHD woman who is doing something so interesting. And so I want to talk about your amazing career in the opera. But before we go there, I would love people to get to know you first. So can we talk about ADHD? Absolutely. Oh, great. So can you tell us, Sally, when were you first diagnosed? I was first actually diagnosed uh, about nine or 10 years ago. I was home visiting my sister in Virginia and trying to get a million things done on the day I was supposed to leave. And she had read an article in the Washington Post about time blindness and ADHD and said, I think you might have this. And so when I got back, I started to explore that with I was already under a psychiatrist's care because of depression. And so we started to explore the ADHD diagnosis. And so this article that you read about time blindness, did it talk about the link between time blindness and ADHD? Or was that just kind of the start? That was, it talked about the link between time blindness and ADHD. And that was what she saw that said, wait a minute, I think you might have ADHD. And it's also based on my whole life and how I've been my whole life. But that particular day, the time blindness was quite apparent. I see. Okay. So then you went back to your psychiatrist and said, maybe we should consider looking at ADHD. Yes. And what did your psychiatrist say? Did he or she know a lot about 
the condition? He knew some about the condition. Um, We started doing some of the testing stuff. I did not go to an ADHD specialist. He did diagnose me with ADHD and I've been on medication for years. And so has that helped with the depression? It has and it hasn't. The depression is something that started a long time ago and it's a comorbid condition. It's clearly not ADHD was misdiagnosed. It is clearly that I have both. Got it. Okay. Which is actually very common. I mean, it's very common that women are diagnosed with, say, anxiety or depression, and it's because of their, you know, they don't even know they have ADHD. So they have all these unresolved ADHD symptoms, but it's also can be comorbid where you have both. Yes. And I definitely have both. Got it. Okay. So tell me, once you were diagnosed, Were there things that you kind of remember about yourself as a child? Because it almost becomes kind of like peeling an onion, right? Something comes up and you're like, oh my gosh, I remember that, you know, when I was a kid. And that's why I did that. I always wondered, were there things about you that now with hindsight, you can see, oh my God, as a child, these are total ADHD symptoms. Oh my goodness. It explained my whole life. Yeah. Completely. One of my earliest memories of academic things at all was in first grade, I went to Catholic school and sister wanted us to listen to her read the directions and not start our phonics paper until she had finished reading the directions. And I looked at the paper, I knew what to do and I started doing it and I got in so much trouble for that. And that was sort of true my whole academic career (laughs) that I was like, oh, I know what I need to do. And I would do it. And I was actually quite academically successful, but I was not very successful at waiting. And I was rarely paying attention to what the teacher was saying because I didn't need to. And I was bored and et cetera, et cetera. So you were really smart. You saw what needed to be done. You didn't need all the directions. You could just jump to what you needed to do. And then you get in trouble for doing that. (laughs) Exactly. So as far as school goes, though, you didn't struggle in school. It was more that you struggled just with kind of following the directions and staying in that box that they had for you. Yes. I did not struggle in school at all. But partly I think that is because the Catholic school system was quite regimented. And so there was a lot of discipline and I was rarely on my own for a project. When we, when we did long-term projects, I could usually pull it together right at the last minute. And that continued all through high school because you had deadlines and clear expectations. Absolutely. You know, many of our listeners have probably heard the story ad nauseum, but I have a son who... He was in the Catholic school system because that's where my daughter was going and started to struggle. I think it was starting in fourth grade. And so for fifth and sixth grade, he found this school that he wanted to go to that was a day school. So it was really kind of much more loosey goosey than his Catholic school was. And he went there for two years and by the middle of the second year, and he loved it. But by the middle of the second year, he was like, there's just not enough structure here. Like he literally knew at that young age that this wasn't going to work. And then he came back to the Catholic school for two years and did well. And then he went to a giant public high school where everything fell off the rails. And then his sophomore and junior year, he ended up at a another kind of more loosey-goosey type of school. That was even worse. And then his senior year, he went back to the Catholic high school and he has just been killing it. So I think for many of us, we think that our creative type brains need less structure. And the reality of it is we definitely need more structure. So there are some things about the Catholic school that I don't love, but I love all the structure and discipline because we thrive there. I went to Catholic schools too. In fact, I was in public school up until junior high, and then that's when my parents pulled me out and I ended up going to the rest of junior high and high school at the Catholic school and did great. So I completely hear you there. So did you struggle with social issues or was that not a big problem for you? 
Um, I'm sort of shy. Really? Which most people do not believe when they meet me. But partly that's because I am a professional actor and I have gotten very good at not being shy in public too much. I'm good one-on-one. I'm good in small groups. I'm good with people that I feel really comfortable with. So when I am in a performing situation or with a lot of other theater people in auditions, I come across as fairly outgoing, but I usually only have a small group that I'm really close to. I was a nerd, so I wasn't, you know, one of the popular kids. (laughs) Um, But I wasn't horribly teased or picked on. So you had some really good friends that were more like you. I did. Yeah, the same interests. And I will say, when I discovered playing basketball in middle school, my basketball team were definitely my peeps. Oh. (laughs) And um, when I did theater and music, all of the theater people are still my closest friends in general. That's so lovely. So you figured out fairly early who your people were and that's who you were comfortable with. And those are the people that you hung out with. Absolutely. To be fair, my father had played basketball and my parents were both theater and music nerds. I grew up in a very musical household. My grandmother had been a professional musician. Her father had been a musician. I mean, it was rampant in my family. Do you see ADHD in your family now? Absolutely. I have a first cousin who's actually a member of the Smart Ass Women group. Wonderful. So do you have a combined type or primarily inattentive? Or I have primarily inattentive. I have discovered over the last few years what my hyperactive things are. And aside from the brain activity, which we all have, I shake my toe a lot and I play with things in my hands or when I was in middle school and high school, I guess, because we didn't use pens early in elementary school, but the caps of pens, I would put in my mouth and chew on them or play with them and create suction and do that all the time. And again, with the 2020 hindsight, I realized that that was an ADHD behavior. Got it. So how many siblings did you grow up with? I have three sisters and a brother. And I am the second. And it's four girls and then a boy. So in your family, did you feel, you know, that your personality, who you were, was really accepted? Oh, yeah. We have a nice, loving, a little bit eccentric family. And I think in general, we were all accepted for who we were. We are all different, but have certain similarities, obviously. And I think even more so now we appreciate each other as people very much. That is so lovely. Okay. So if you could tell us, how did you get into opera? What was the, what was your, your path? My path was an unusual one. I was doing theater and music in high school. And I started voice lessons at 14. Wait, let me backtrack. So at 10, I did a production of The Sound of Music. Oh, that was my favorite, especially when I was young. I loved The Sound of Music. My sister Adele and I were the two youngest girls in this production of The Sound of Music. She was Gretel. I was Marta. And the captain was played by a man named Richard Wilmer, who still is a voice teacher in the Washington, D.C. area. And he told my parents 
at the time that when I was ready to study voice, he wanted to teach me. And that was when I was 10. So at 14, when I was doing a lot of music and theater in high school, my parents called him because they didn't want me to do any damage to my voice. So were your parents vocalists? My mother had sung and still did sing. She was singing with the Alexandria Choral Society, which is how I got several opportunities to sing as a child. And she played the piano and my father had acted. And so they were very aware of the things that people did with their voice. My mother's best friend had actually become a professional pianist, vocalist, and teacher. Mm. And she was my godmother. Oh, you were surrounded. I was. I was totally (laughs) surrounded. How could you not win, right? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I mean, this path... While I took a roundabout path, it was set up for me. And even at 10, can I ask you, when you were singing in The Sound of Music, were you just in love with what you were doing? Absolutely. Yeah. And at 10, I had a very high voice, but I was put on the second soprano part because I could hold the harmony. Mm. And when I think of the title tune of The Sound of Music today... I still have to think really hard to sing the actual melody because (laughs) the harmony, the second soprano line is so drilled into me. Wow. So I started voice lessons at 14 and kept them all through high school. And then when I went to college, I went to the University of Virginia and I was not going to go into music. Music was not practical. People Uh couldn't make a living at music. I was going to be an attorney like my father. (laughs) Okay. And, you know, the ADHD brain thinking on the go all the time. Law is actually, if you can get through law school, law makes sense, right? Absolutely. But then I went to UVA and I started studying Russian and I was studying history and I loved it, but I was not very good at school in college because I'd had all that discipline and all that structure. And I had been valedictorian of my high school. And I got to the University of Virginia and I was in the honors program, which had no structure. Oh, You didn't even have to major. You could do anything. You had no requirements except to get a certain number of hours to graduate. And I did not know what I was doing at all. And then I met my now ex-husband my first year, and I partly majored in him. (laughs) And all of this is so common for first-year college students, especially those of us. I can so relate to your story. Those of us that did really well in high school because we had so much structure. And then you get into college and not only do you have all these classes that you have to deal with, but you have to get your laundry done. You have to get yourself fed. Like it it just becomes a train wreck. Indeed. And I almost never got breakfast because I was not up to go to the cafeteria and get food before my first class. I learned a lot about how to structure myself during college. So the first semester was not great, but it got better. What were you majoring in? I was studying African American history. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And Russian language and literature, which interesting combination. Don't go together. <laughs> <laughs> for normal people, but actually for my brain it was very interesting. It was two completely different disciplines. It's also they're both very relevant in my current career because Opera is an historical art form, and a lot of the stories are historic stories, or they are old literature, and I do Russian opera. So, you know, there's a lot of relevancy now, but the path was a little strange. Yeah, we don't see it when we're looking at it straight out. We have to be behind it and looking back. <laughs> to exactly. Get it. It's definitely not linear. Yeah. Then I got to the end of college and I had a bunch of applications for graduate school 
for graduate school in history. And uh, I did really well on the GREs. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just go on to grad school because that's the next natural step. And then I thought, no, that's not what I want to do. What I really want to do is perform. All I really want to do is sing. And how did you know that, given that you stopped all this, right, once you left high school? I did not totally stop it. Ah. I was still taking voice lessons at home when I was home. Okay. I was singing with the University of Virginia Women's Chorus. I'm going to give them a shout out. And with an acapella group, the Virginia Bells. And I was getting so much out of music. Mm. And those were my major activities. Sally, is that where you found that you were getting a lot of positive emotion too? When you'd go there, you just felt good? Absolutely. Yeah. And I was with my people. I was always uplifted by the music and by my colleagues and by being part of a group singing. It's just full of endorphins and all of those positive emotions and positive feelings. And it was really where I wanted to be. So then I went back home to Virginia, or to Northern Virginia, where I had grown up. And I stayed there for a year working for my voice teacher. He ran a small opera company and I was working for him to do the business side of the opera company and getting paid, but also studying voice every day. And then also feeling somewhat miserable because my boyfriend had moved out to California for graduate school. So we spent a year on opposite coasts. And then he found out he was going to be moving to Northern California for an internship at NASA Ames in Mountain View. And He was at grad school in Southern California. I did not want to move to Southern California. I could not see myself there at all. But I could see myself in Northern California. And there were a lot of good singing opportunities in Northern California. So Sally, at this time, what were you thinking about as far as career? Was it in the works at all as far as opera or did you not know? What was the goal? The goal was opera. Ah, okay. But I didn't know how to do it. Because I was not in school for opera. I didn't have all of those tools that most people who are studying opera in an academic situation are given lots of opportunities and they have lots of tools. And I was just cobbling it together. So Sally, if you want to go into opera, this sounds so ADHD what you're telling me, but first my question is, if you want to go into opera, are most of the opera singers, do they come from the Juilliards and the, you know, the schools that are specific to opera? Is it rare to come in the way you're coming in? It is very rare to come in the way. Ah, I love it. It's so ADHD. Okay. It is not unheard of, Uh but it is rare. Okay. Because I would assume there's tons of competition, right? Absolutely. There's huge amounts of competition. So we'll get to that. (laughs) I, I moved to the Bay Area. I knew no one. And I delivered singing telegrams as my first job in the Bay Area. And I was singing for a living. It was an opera, but I was singing for a living. (laughs) And then I just did a lot of auditions. And I took community college classes in acting and music theory and took classes in music history and really tried to educate myself musically using every resource I could get my hands on, I subscribed to everything. It's now Classical Singer Magazine, but at that time it was the New York Opera newsletter or something, and it had auditions, and I was auditioning for whatever I could do. And I did a few things and started getting more known, and then people would call me and say, can you do this for us? Or I heard you at this audition and I would love to have you do this role. So it really started picking up and I married my boyfriend 
And he actually, because he was in tech, he encouraged me to quit my day job and just focus on singing, which was really amazing. So then I was able to take some extra classes and I took the opera workshop at San Jose State University, which was amazing because I was with other people who were learning to be in opera. And I met some directors who've been incredibly influential for me. And one of my absolute best friends in all the world, we met at the opera workshop at San Jose State. And I got several opportunities with Opera San Jose, which sort of led directly to my auditioning for the opera chorus at San Francisco. And I auditioned for the opera chorus in San Francisco. I did one year in what's called the extra chorus, which is the supplemental singers who are all professional singers who augment the size of the regular chorus for the larger, grander operas. And then the next year, I did not receive a contract from the San Francisco Opera, but I did 11 different roles that year in various companies around California. And then the next year I auditioned for the opera chorus and I sang the right thing on the right day. (laughs) He was in the right mood and somebody retired unexpectedly right before the year. And I was called back for the job and then I ultimately got it and I have been in the full-time opera chorus at San Francisco Opera since 1998. Oh my. So what, what is that, 21 years? Yes, this is my 22nd season. I think that's right. Do you love going to work every day? I do. I really love going to work. Rehearsals can be tedious, especially for the ADHD brain. And I am lucky because when you set it to music, I can memorize it quickly. It goes to a different part of my brain than the part that puts my keys in the refrigerator. Ah, That is so interesting, Sally. So are you telling us then that you struggle with remembering things, but not when whatever you need to remember is put to music? Absolutely. Huh, that's so interesting. I never, ever have problems memorizing music. I can memorize an opera in just a few rehearsals. I'm usually one of the very first people to memorize the opera if it's a new opera. And if it's an old opera that I learned young, I don't even have to look at the score at the first rehearsal. Yeah, that is so interesting how depending on what age you were, it sticks in your memory. And then other things. uh, Yeah, I've had that same experience. But it's also true that if I memorized it five years ago, it will come back much more quickly, even if I don't remember it immediately. It will come back much more quickly if it's with music. It's just so much easier for me. So if someone said, here, I want you to memorize this speech, would that be difficult for you? That's harder. I can do it if I can sort of make music out of it, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. You know, dialogue in a show. If you have a rhythm to it, if you can make it work in that musical part of your brain, it works for me. You know, remembering why I came into a room is not always the easiest thing for me, (laughs) but remembering dialogue from a show I did 10 years ago is much easier. So I know in our Facebook group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, um, there are a lot of women who say that that's how they get work done. You know, if they have music playing and usually it's music without words for them, they just feel like they're much more productive. And I subscribe to that as well. But you give me any words, then I'm screwed because I'm creating all these images in my head. And <laughs> Amen. I find yeah. that. And of course, because that's what I do professionally, I am singing along to everything. And so that's where my brain is. <laughs> it's on the way. You know what's so interesting about opera? You've made me remember this. But as a child, like, uh, you know, my mom would drag us to some operas. And I remember, and literally, I felt like I was dragged at that age. I'm so appreciative of it now. But I remember Electra, which was a three-hour opera. And the only way I got through it was, and I think it was one set, too. Costumes are just nothing that you would think, you know, a 12-year-old girl would be fascinated by. And I remember the way I got through it is 
I had the music playing in my head and I created my own story to the music. <laughs> and the music for Electra, that wouldn't be very easy to do. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a really tough opera. The other ones I remember, I have much fonder memories of, but I remember Electra thinking, I think, I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this three hours. <laughs> So Sally, what are the ADHD traits that you feel are responsible for your success in the opera, but, you know, also in life? Well, I think the biggest one is that I'm pretty quick. My brain is agile enough to switch from one role to the next to... If a director wants to try something, I can go with that and go right back to the other thing and move on to the next thing very quickly. It's especially helpful in the opera chorus where we take on so many different roles, sometimes in the same opera, and we're rehearsing multiple operas in a day. It was very useful when I was just doing solo roles my agent would send me out on auditions and I would always have rep that was appropriate for the audition because I was always learning new things because I loved to learn new music. I still love to learn new music. And I research the heck out of everything that I do. So we're doing an opera this summer based on Steve Jobs. So I'm reading the Steve Jobs biography and I study languages and I love to study languages and I love to sing. So you prepare for a role in opera just like you would be if you were an actor. Absolutely. We are actors. I didn't know that that's what you would do, but I guess it makes sense, right? Because it's all about emotion ultimately. And how do you click into that emotion if you don't have any information on like the background of what was going on? Exactly. And we translate everything we sing. If we're singing in a foreign language, you have to know what you're saying, because otherwise it's not going to make any sense. If it doesn't make sense to you, it's not going to make sense to an audience. So everything that I do, I have to translate. I go above and beyond research wise for a lot of things because I like that. It's fun for me. Again, I think that's an ADHD thing that I want to delve right in. And It totally is if you're interested. <laughs> exactly. So I want to learn everything about this. You know, there's one little passage in a chorus that we're doing that's about Japanese calligraphy. And I went down a long rabbit hole about what these symbols are and what they mean and what these words are. But that was fun. And I can sort of justify it as a professional thing. Absolutely. So Sally, have you always felt different than other people? Or do you feel like you found your people, your tribe early on, and so you haven't? I think I found my tribe relatively early on. I was very nurtured in my family, and there's certainly evidence that there are other people in my family who also have ADHD, although I am the one who was diagnosed. But I grew up in a pretty creative family, so that was always part of my life. I started dance lessons at five and I started voice lessons at 14. And I have always been with performance and creativity my whole life. So you definitely felt like you were understood. Yes. Which is... I feel like I wasn't always understood by people outside of my tribe, for sure. Especially the time thing. My time blindness is really bad. It always has been. What do you mean by that? I never know how long it's going to take to do anything. I am late perpetually, although I try really hard not to be. But that's been true my whole life. And I'm always running late. And there's always one more thing that I want to get done. And, oh, this will only take five minutes. And then 20 minutes later, it's 20 minutes later. And what is the deal with that? How many times do we have to do something to figure out how long it's going to take? I mean, and I never overestimate the amount of time. I always underestimate it, or I would say 95% of the time. Is that you too? It is absolutely me. And as I've explored more and more about the ADHD, I realize that one of my problems with time is that if something has ever taken me 
less time. That is the amount that it takes, not what it usually takes. Exactly. So exactly. If, if one day it took me 25 minutes to get to work, it always takes 25 minutes. So why would I leave an hour and a half, even though it's rush hour and there's <laughs> traffic and... It is so true. We're just eternal optimists. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I can so relate to that. Okay. So what do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is? What is it for you? For me, there are a couple of keys. One is to do something that you absolutely love. Bingo. And the other one is set timers. <laughs> Yeah, I have them all over my house, in my shower, on my desk. I wear, you know, an Apple Watch. Me too. It's still everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So would that be one of your number one ADHD workarounds? Absolutely. That is definitely one of my number one ADHD workarounds. And it took me years, but I finally found a calendar system that works for me, really. Tell me about that. I'm still sort of struggling with it. Well, I do have one of those big notebook kind of things, but it is something that's really flexible. It's done on big circles that you add paper to and take paper away from. Is it something you created? It is something I bought the elements of and put it together in my own way. Okay, so start from the beginning because I'm curious. What does it look like? So... It's, may I name the name? Oh my gosh, please do. Yeah, it's the Circa system from Levenger. Okay, I'm going to put a link in in the show notes to this. Yeah, I love it because you get, I use the junior size, but it comes in two sizes. It comes in a full size and it comes in a junior size. And it's basically paper that has notches cut out of it so that you can put those on these rings. And so the spine of the book is rings and you can get those in a variety of sizes. So I have them in a huge size and I have my calendar. Once a month is done, I take it off and I put the next month on for the next year so that I always have basically a year going so I can do future engagements and all of that and keep it up. So Sally, what is it about that system that works better for you than any other system you've used? I think the ability to write something on a piece of paper and then put it where it belongs. So I have a lot of extra sheets of the things to do sheet and the uh, important items sheet. And there's, there's all kinds of different things that are available and just some blank pages that I will write on those and then file them in that system where, you know, I have tabs for self-care and I have tabs for my daughter and for projects and for goals. So I have lots of different places that I can put things. And I like to have it on paper. I actually keep a rolling iCal as well, but I always check against both. And if I have a default, it's definitely the paper one. Okay. So it sounds like what works so well in this calendaring system, this circus system is the fact that you can move things around and and change where it needs to be. It's super flexible. Okay. And it has a calendar that has lots of space for each date and a to-do list right on the same page as your week. It's right opposite so that you have what you want to get accomplished in that week. So I have the running to-do list and the calendar at the same time. I lost this once in the airport. Thank God it was found. Um, I now have one of those little tile things in it. Yes. I love tiles. I do too. They're fabulous have them on everything. But now I have one in this slipped into the file folder so that it can be found. And so if the listeners don't know what tiles are, I think it's tiles.com. I will put the link in the show notes, but you can basically put these little tiles onto everything from your purse to your 
calendar planners, whatever, and your golf clubs. And so if I don't play golf, but I just thought of that, you can even put them in your car. And so whatever you lose, you just go on this app and it'll tell you where it is. And there's a whole community that'll help you find it if you lose something. They're phenomenal, actually. I love the idea of putting it in my car. I did not think of that. That's great. (laughs) Sally, where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what it is that you do? So it is currently under construction, Uh but I do have a website that is under construction, sallymuzon.com. And I also have sallymezzo.com because Sally Mezzo is my handle for a lot of things. Are you on Instagram or? I am on Instagram, although I don't post very much. It's mostly so that I can follow my daughter. Um, And I'm on Facebook and I am on Twitter. And all of those are Sally Mezzo, S-A-L-L-Y-M-E-Z-Z-O, because I am a mezzo soprano. Ah, And is there anything on any of these sites if people want to hear your singing, your voice? Um, There will be. (laughs) Okay. So one of of my projects that has been put off for way too long is I have a friend who builds websites and I've already paid him. We just haven't done this yet. I just find building a website is just the hardest thing for me. Just so many moving parts and you want it to be perfect and it never is. And I starting it and then finish, oh, it's, it's hell for me. So I get it. And I, well, the ADHD thing, I put things off and put things off and, oh, that's not the most important thing right at this minute. And so I hope that this podcast will actually help jumpstart me because we recently talked about how to do this remotely. And so we're going to do it. Well, I think you are going live sometime. I think it might be, it's the end of April, maybe the 29th. Okay. So I have a month to get it (laughs) together. Okay. Yeah. By the time we get there, we'll see how far you've gotten. Um, Anyway, Sally, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. I just, I just love learning about every single ADHD brain. And it's so obvious when you talk to you know, brilliant women with ADHD that how they get to where they get is always using their ADHD strengths. And of course, they're in their area of interest. So thank you for spending time with us here today. I just really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you, Tracy. This was really fun. It was. So That's what I have for you for this week. As always, you are listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this episode with Sally, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too can discover their amazing strengths. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me an audio message or reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smartass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smartass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.